Lights and shadows can make our VR experiences look great, but they're incredibly expensive, so let's learn how to optimize them. There is a ton to go over in this video, so we are just going to hop right into this project. And if you haven't set up the universal render pipeline, I'm going to suggest that you go over to my video where I covered that and watch that first before you go over this video. Now, with that out of the way, let's talk about optimizing our lights. One thing you might notice if you just converted to the universal render pipeline is if you already had lights in the scene, your lights might be broken. And mine were, and I did fix them. So I'm going to show you how I fixed them. And there were two main methods that I was shown. The first one is you select your universal render pipeline asset. You come over here, you make sure that this is at least set to one, because if we turn it to zero, they'll all be turned off. Cast shadow is set to true. And then we want to make sure that per pixel is not disabled. And it is also not disabled here. And if that doesn't fix it, there's another way that should fix it as well. And that's going to be by going to edit, preferences, and then if we go to GI cache, if we clean the cache, then that should also fix it. And that was actually what fixed it for me. Now that we've done some of that troubleshooting, let us talk about the universal render pipeline asset settings. So again, we're going to come back here and we're going to go under lighting. You'll see here again at main light, if we disable it, the main light is actually going to be the directional light that acts as kind of the sun here in the scene. So this is going to be all the settings pertaining to that. So any changes here, you'll see that we have the shadows from the sun here. If we disable it, they're going to go away. And then if I go to per pixel, they come back. Cast shadows, again, they go away. If we're talking about optimization, obviously, if we lower the shadow resolution, it's going to look a little rougher, but that can improve performance for you. Next, let's talk about our additional lights. And you'll see here in this scene, I have three lights set up. And if we come to the settings over in additional lights, we have a few options here. We can disable them, which we don't want to do. We have per vertex which you'll see that it just kind of leaves the light here, but it doesn't have the backlighting. And then we have per pixel. And if we were doing real-time lights, then this would actually be more expensive to use, but the quality is obviously better. And so here you also have the per object limit. This determines how many lights can be used to illuminate objects in a scene. So if I lower this, you'll see it's going to slowly take them out. And as I raise it, it will put more in. Well, if there's more in the scene, that is. Of course, we have the settings of casting shadows. We can turn that on and off. We can increase or decrease the resolution. And next we have shadows. But before I hop down there, I just want to mention if you're ever going to do real time shadows, really consider what the cost would be for that. If you can avoid it, you should. So looking at the shadows down here, we have this max distance. And what this is going to do is it's going to say, well, whatever the max distance from the camera, that's when we'll start rendering shadows. So if I change it to one, you'll notice that the shadows will disappear. If I change it to five, you'll see the shadows aren't there. But if I go in, they start to appear. And that's how we change that. So if you're having a scene where things are a little more compartmentalized in different rooms, you might want to play with this and you might get a little more performance out of it unless we're baking our shadows, which then, well, it shouldn't matter too much. So I'm just going to leave that at 10 for now. I think the default's actually 50. Yeah, I'll just do that. Next, we have the cascade count and the cascade count will help determine how detailed the shadows are when our camera is near it. But again, that comes at the cost of performance. We also have these sliders down here for depth bias and normal bias, which Unity says, if you're noticing weird artifacts with your shadows and your objects, try playing with this and that might fix whatever weird behavior you're noticing. And finally, we have soft shadows. Soft shadows will help blend in here and make it look a little smooth, a little more real. It just kind of blends in like you would see in real life, but that is also a cost on our performance. So you might want to turn that off. So now that we've explored the lighting and shadow settings in the Universal Render Pipeline asset, let's talk about our lights and baking lights. So kicking things off, I want to show you the Light Explorer. So if we go over to Window Rendering and Light Explorer, you'll see here this actually displays all our lights in the scene. So it's a very convenient way that we can change our lights to do different things and try to optimize them instead of having to click through every single one in the scene. And we can play with some of the different modes 
modes that these are in, you'll see we can make them real time, which that means while we're running, it is going to be doing all the calculations for the shadows in our project, but that is incredibly expensive. So where we can, we might want to bake them. And that means we are going to do all the calculations up front and we're gonna create a texture map that's gonna lay over all of our static objects in the scene. And we also have a mixed mode. And the mixed mode is kind of like the best of both worlds. So if you have a light that needs to be both baked so we can reduce the calculations there, but we still might want it to move around dynamically, you might wanna consider mixed mode. But I'm not gonna dive into mixed mode too much in this video here, I wanna just focus primarily on baked. So with that in mind, I am going to even change our sun, which is this directional light from before. I'm going to change that to baked as well. We've set all our lights to baked. Let's get to baking. And if we go to window, rendering, and lighting, you're going to get the lighting window. And I'm going to drag it over here just because it's a little longer. I'm going to go ahead and exit out of that for now. And you're going to see we are missing a lighting setting. So we'll just create a new one. I'm just going to name it FFOS light settings. So our first setting here is real-time global illumination. And what that does is when we are seeing things in real life, light doesn't just hit a surface and stop. It actually bounces all around and hits different surfaces on top of that. And real-time global illumination will do that in real time. So that's going to be incredibly taxing. And if we're aiming for something like the Quest 2, we don't want to use that. So I'm going to go ahead and mark that off. Next, we have mixed lighting. And in mixed lighting, we have baked global illumination. We want to make sure we're checking that because that's going to allow us to do global illumination, but bake it into our light maps, which it's nice to have a little of that global illumination going on with the forward rendering process that we're going to be using. And then we have light mode and we have a few to pick from here. And I'm going to play with shadow mask and baked and direct in a different video. For this one, I'm going to just set it as subtractive. So what subtractive does is it only allows dynamic shadows from our direct light source instead of our spotlights and our direct light source. So if I press play here, you'll see since I have it as subtractive, when I rotate this, the shadows are moving when the sun is moving. But if I choose one of the spotlights, if I move it, the shadow on the wall just kind of stays where it is. It's not moving like the sun was moving. And so there you go, that's subtractive. Now we've made it to the heavy lifting of the video, the light mapping settings. And starting off, we have the light mapper. And this is going to determine how we produce our light map, what processes it and produces it. And so we could go through the CPU, GPU, or this enlightened function. And I'm going to choose GPU here just because it's a little quicker for me. And you're going to have to determine if your CPU or GPU is better. Try the GPU out though. So for the rest of these settings, I'm not going to go into great detail on every single one. If you want, there will be a link below to my blog post that will describe everything for you. If you want to go into the nitty gritty of all these here, I'm just going to give us a short introduction to some of the most important ones or the ones that I found to be the most helpful to change. Now, the direct samples, indirect samples, and environment samples, these all correlate with direct light, indirect light, and also calculations with the environment and how much we're sampling. So the higher these numbers are, the better our quality will be, but it will also take a lot more time to bake our light maps. And trust me, if our scene's big enough, this can actually take up to hours and hours if we keep these numbers big. If you want to just do prototyping, you can just reduce these numbers down until you get kind of what you want in your scene and then raise them back up. And you'll see here, we also have a light probe sample multiplier. That multiplier actually pertains to all these. It just amplifies all these numbers. And then next we have the minimum bounces and max bounces. So like before, when we were doing global illumination, light hits a surface and bounces off it. This is the bouncing. So it's going to say minimum. We want our rays to bounce once. Uh, maximum, we want it to bounce twice. And Unity says for most scenes, bouncing up to two times is good enough. For light map resolution, when you're still prototyping and building outs and baking light maps constantly to get your scenes right, you want to reduce this to 10 and that will allow you to rapidly bake your scenes. And the higher the resolution, you know, the higher the memory is going to be for your light maps and the longer it will take to bake. But again, the quality will be a lot better. So I say start off low and then when you're finalizing, you know, crank it back up to a higher resolution. 
Here again, for max light map size, we can, you know, have higher quality, have higher settings, or we can reduce it again. And that is always kind of the trade-off. Again, light map compression, you know, we can have a low quality compression, but that will reduce our size again. And I think you're kind of getting the understanding of this, of what our trade-offs are with our light maps. We, you know, we, we can reduce things, it'll make things big quicker, and it will reduce file size, but the quality will be less. So with that, let's try generate lighting. If we generate lighting, that is how we bake our maps and you'll see it did not generate lights at all. It actually took them all away. And what's going on is I don't actually have any objects in this scene set to static. And we do need them set to static because again, we're baking lights. We're saying these objects aren't moving. These shadows should be permanent. And so yeah, it's not showing anything anymore. So I'm gonna go over here, okay, click this, clear the baking data, get our lights back and let's mark some things as static. So of course, you know, the one way we can mark these as static is just clicking the object, going up here and hitting static. And so this will contribute to global illumination. And you can actually see that here, that there's a setting in the mesh renderer to contribute to global illumination. So if you wanted to, you can actually click on another object, come down here and also click on this, say yes to all the children. And then that too will contribute to global illumination, just like a static object. So I'm just gonna select all these and start them off as static objects. Now, another thing to mention is if we are importing models from outside, we also might need to do a little extra work on them too, if we were to bake a light map on top of them. So an example would be, I'm gonna grab this hand model here that I have, and I'm gonna come over here and it says generate light map UVs. All you do is click that box, hit apply. And if I were to add it to the scene and had a light on it, generate a light map on top of it, it would work, or hopefully it should work. Now let's go over and generate a light map. So let's go ahead and generate this light map. I'm gonna click here and you'll notice that it changes. It's made it a lot lighter. Again, we have a lower resolution on this, so it's not gonna be high definition. Yeah, if we come over here to bake lights, you can actually see what the light map looks like that it's laying on top of all these static objects. And to fully demonstrate what this light mapper is doing is if I take this directional light and turn it off, you'll notice it hasn't affected anything in the scene because, well, we've already baked the lights onto this, even if I press play. And yeah, nothing has changed. But if I come back here, go over to lighting and clear it, you'll see that, yes, since I've removed the directional light, obviously it should be dark. And so there you have it, a kind of short introduction to light maps. Obviously this does not cover everything. Lights are very complex. And you know what, I want to go over light probes in a different video, but for now that is baking lights. And so feel free to experiment, see what you can do with this. And I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.